what role does the U.S. play in this war? Could they have done something to avoid the war? Uh, did they have a role to play in forcing Vladimir Putin's hand? Do they have a role to play in um, de-escalating the war towards a peace agreement and the opposite? If it does escalate uh, towards something like the use of a tactical nuclear weapon, are they to blame? Are, are we to blame? Oh man, somebody sent me an email a while ago with great words. Um, there's a specific way to navigate a conversation where you can kind of like contribute to a negative event, but you're not really the one responsible for it. Um, like the classic example is a woman goes out late at night, gets a little bit too drunk, and then something happens. And it's like, while there might've been steps she could have taken to mitigate the risk, it's not her fault of what happened because the um, responsibility rests on the on the agent making the choice, right? There's a chooser at some point that is choosing to do wrong or evil. I don't believe in any of the arguments that say the United States has contributed to Russia's position on Ukraine or the actions that they've taken on Ukraine. Um, there are several arguments that some people, uh, some even political scholars are, are, are putting out there to say that the United States is to blame, but I find them completely unconvincing. I think that when you ask the question of like, what is the United States role or what has our role been? I think it's really important for us. I don't think we even agree as a country on what our role should be, which I think is a hard one because you've got this kind of, there's this growing populist movement in the United States. It might be the far left and the far right. And I think populists tend to have this kind of isolationist view of the world where the United States should just be our own thing. We shouldn't be telling anybody what to do. We shouldn't be the world police. And then kind of more in these like center left, center right positions. And then across a lot of Europe, you've got, well, okay, the United States is kind of like the big kid on the block. Like we're looking to them for guidance and leadership on situations like what's going on in Ukraine. So insofar as uh, the original question is like, what what is like the United States responsibility? I think we have a responsibility to ensure the relative like freedom prosperity and stability across Europe. I think that defending Ukraine's sovereignty and right to their borders is a part of that. And I don't believe that prior to the invasion in 2022, I don't think the United States was contributing to Russia invading that country. Um, I know there are arguments given that like the expansion of NATO, you know, has, has something that's been threatening to Russia, but the Baltics joined and Russia didn't do anything about it. The invasion to Crimea was very clearly a response to the revolution of 2014. The invasion on the borders is clearly a response to um, Ukraine winning that uh, civil war in the Southeast and the Donbass and Russia becoming more aggressive. I don't think that you can blame any of that on, on NATO expansion. There's no NATO countries that are threatening Russia or invading Russia. Do you think there is a nuclear threat? Do you think about this? Do you worry about this, that there is a threat of a, a tactical nuclear weapon being dropped? I think that possibility exists either way. And I think the responsibility for that is on Russia because it, it can't. It just can't be the case that if you have nukes, you're allowed to invade countries and take their land. Because if anything, I think that that down the road also increased, increases the potential for nuclear problems in the future, right? Because at that point, either every single country has to acquire their own nuclear weapons, because if you don't, Russia's gonna mess with you, or every single country has to join NATO, and now what, we're back at square zero, ground zero, square one, where people are like, oh, well, look, all these countries joining NATO is aggressive towards Russia. Like, what are you gonna do? Yeah, you've mentioned that um, there's a, complicated calculus going on with the countries that have uh, that have nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. And what's our responsibility? Are you allowed to do anything you want to countries that don't have nuclear weapons? That's a really tricky discussion. For sure. Because what is US supposed to do if Russia drops a tactical nuclear weapon? There's a set of options, mm -hmm. none of which are good. Mm -hmm. And it's such a tricky moment right now because uh, the things that Biden and other public figures say, I feel like has a significant impact on the way this game turns out. Because I think mutually assured destruction is partially a game of words. No. Yeah. I, I mean, I believe in the power of conversation of leaders talking to each other. I feel like you have to have an, a balance between threat and compromise and like empathy for the needs, the geopolitical, the economic needs of a nation, um, but also sort of respect and represent your own interests. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a tricky one. Like, how do you play the, how do you play the hand? It reminds me of, um, I don't know if you've ever heard in like evolutionary psych or evolutionary biology, there are things called tit for tat strategies. 
it kind of reminds me of that where it's like if like uh there, there are a whole bunch of these little biological mechanisms where creatures will develop like socializing like tit for tat if you do something bad to me i'm going to do something bad for you and then more complicated schemes will come out where it'll be like tit tit for tat or it's like you can make one mistake and then i'm going to get you if you do a second one or it could be tit 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 for tat or there could be tit for tat tat for tit. there's like all these like back and forths where creatures kind of optimize themselves and um yeah i think something the united states did really well in terms of that kind of conversational strategy and i approved of this in the beginning was biden was very clear about setting out like the exact level of u.s involvement for the war we're not going to do a no-fly zone there's not going to be u.s troops on the ground in ukraine but we are going to send a whole bunch of money and a whole bunch of arms and a whole bunch of intel to them and i thought he did a good job at laying out like the limitation of the u.s involvement while opening as much as we could in the ways that we could help but the um yeah that looming threat of some sort of tactical nuclear weapon i think on the table right now is like it's going to be the annihilation of like russian sea forces and everything but you know what happens if it continues to escalate I, that's like a world that nobody wants to <laughs> nobody wants to be in yeah so we talked about difficult conversations and again thank you so much for reviewing the yay conversation let me ask you about putin mm -hmm. speaking of difficult conversations so if you sit down if i sit down with somebody like vladimir putin or vladimir Zelensky, what's the right way to have that conversation oh man we can talk about that one or we could talk about somebody more well understood through history like some like stalin or hitler something mm -hmm. like that maybe that's an easier example to illustrate how to handle extremely difficult conversations yeah i mean i can handle really difficult conversations between like two people um leaders of countries though you're there's so much that you are representing in that conversation i guess the thing that would be interesting to me would be like what is Vladimir Putin's interest? Like, what is the genuine interest that he has in the conflict? Because I think finding out, like, what is your buy in or what is your, like, what is the driving force keeping you here is probably the most important thing. Um, I think for Zelensky, I think it's a, it's quite a bit more simpler because he's, he's on the defense. So it's defending his country and his people. Um, for Putin, I've heard all sorts of things. Uh, you know, Dugan has his writings on, uh, you know, like the East versus the West, the collapse of the West in the face of like all of the liberalism and the weird LGBT stuff that they criticize. You've got the desire to like return to this like former Soviet Union-esque thing. You've got Putin's quotes that the collapse of the Soviet Union was the biggest geopolitical disaster, you know, of 20th century. And I guess figuring out like, what is Putin after? I'm not actually sure. I don't know the answer to that question. I know a lot of people write about it, but yeah. Well, there's a lot of answers to that question. There's a lot of answers that he can give to that question. So say I sit down with him for three hours and talk about it. I think this is a really interesting distinction because you do do difficult conversations in the space of ideas. Mm -hmm. But also in your stream, you have, I mean, there's a bunch of drama going on. There's there's the human psychology is laid out. Mm -hmm. Uh, in its full richness before you. So to me, with leaders, I think a part of the conversation has to be about the human psychology. Sure. Not like a meta conversation, but like really understand what they feel, what they fear, who they are as a human being. Like as a family man, as a, as a person proud of their country, as a person with an ego, as a person who's been affected if not corrupted by powers all of us can be and likely are mm -hmm. so all of that that gives context to then the answers about what do you want in this war because the, the answers about what you want in this war will be political answers it's like it's like a game that's being played again with words and politicians are incredibly good at playing that game mm -hmm. i think the deeper truth comes from understanding the human being from which those words come 